Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Zach Greenberg. I'm Abigail Rocklin. And we both are part of the OU Accelerator team this summer and really excited to be here with Rabbi Chaim Bernstein. And thank you so much, Rabbi Bernstein, for taking the time to speak with us. We really excited to get to know you better and hear all about your venture. So to kick it off, uh, Rabbi Bernstein, do you mind telling us a little bit about your background leading up to you founding your venture, Chinuch Yehudi? My pleasure. Good morning, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, sir. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I was, was born and raised in the five towns um, for high school and based my base, formative base medish years, I was in Yeshiva Farakway. Um, I went to, to Queens College for, uh, at night and earned a degree, a BA in economics. I then proceeded to go to Mir Yeshiva in Israel. Um, <clears throat> upon marrying in 1994, um, I joined the Kolo, I went back to Israel and joined the Kolo and Mir Yeshiva. And then um, uh, the four years after that, um, I went to BMG, Bismarck Shkiva in Lakewood, and I had smicha from the, the Lakewood Yeshiva. In 2002, uh, our small family at that time moved to the fledgling community of Waterbury, Connecticut, where I became a Magid Shir in the Yeshiva of Waterbury. We were actually the 22nd family that joined the community. Now there are about uh, close to 170, 180 families here in the community. Um, wow. Yeah. yeah. It has certainly grown, thank God. So, and so for the last, you know, for the last 18 years, I've been a Rebbe in the base medish of the Yeshiva of Waterbury. Wow, that's awesome. The, is that, that's for high school students? So the base, this is post, post high school, post high school. Okay, cool, awesome. <laughs> okay, so, uh, for the most part of your career, your and your background, like I, I mean, you know, you've done teaching, but it's not so related to uh, doing per se cure of and dealing. Like I know that your venture deals a lot with the Israeli population. So, what motivated you to go into such a venture? This is a question I get asked very, very frequently. Why in the world? In fact, when I started my venture, someone asked me. It seems that people are more, more exiting Kirov, and suddenly you're starting a venture into Kirov. Why are you doing this? So that is a, that's a very good question. In terms of professionally, um, I always had an interest in Kirov. Before I, I joined the, the staff here at the Yeshiva Waterbury, I was thinking very seriously about, about doing Kirov. You know, Hashem led me in a different path. But um, nonetheless, I was always interested in the field of education. You know, uh, I always, I, I enjoyed my, both my parents were teachers. So it's something that I always enjoyed. Wow. Um, and I understand being in yeshiva actually, uh, being a Rebbe, even though it was for older children, really enhanced my feeling of the impact of education having on a child. And a child's not necessarily, you know, you, you know obviously an older, I was dealing, dealing with more, you know, post teenage years from 17 to 21, but I see the impact in terms of foundation that you give a child. And what I realized was is that the earlier that you could give a child a, a proper foundation in the basics of Judaism, that will impact him for a lifetime. Him or her, I should say, boy or girl for a lifetime. So I would say that the, my, my years of teaching in the base Medrash really gave me a, a greater appreciation for the impact of education. So I would say it's a, it would be a natural flow in, even though it wasn't necessarily dealing with the Israeli community. Awesome. So we heard a little bit about your background. Can you now give us the background about Chinuch Yehudi and what it does and how it came about? Let's start with a short story. Um, I have a, a friend who is, was working for a national organization here in the USA to recruit public school kids across the nation to Jewish day schools. And then one fun, one fun day about five and a half years ago, I asked him, um, name is Hillel, Hillel, how's it going? And he said to me, actually, Chaim, terrible. I'm having a very hard time getting kids to go to Jewish day school. It's, like, it's really not, I'm having a hard time. He then proceeds to tell me about a school that was started in 2008 or 9 by Torah Masora, the, the Torah Masora, the National Association of Hebrew Day Schools, um, for the Israeli population in South Florida. And at that time, they had between about 100 and 120 children um, in the school, 85 to 90 percent coming from non-observant Torah homes. And being in the field of education, just looking around what's going on in the United States today, that's very, very rare. Very rare to have an Orthodox Jewish day school with that percentage of 
non-observant kids. So yeah, I mean, again, as I said, I'm in an education. I proceeded to call the principal. I said, what's going on? What's happening here? And over the course of my research, I found some two very interesting points, which I think we have to mention. Number one is that the Israeli population, first of all, is growing here in the United States. Uh, you'd be surprised if I were to ask you what percentage of the Israeli population is the, uh, of the American Jewish population is the Israeli population today? And the answer is close to 15%. There are 750,000 Israelis here in the USA today, wow. assuming a Jewish population of 5 million Jews. That's crazy. Yeah, most people. Yeah, yeah. I feel like a lot. I feel like you more think that like more Americans are going to Israel, like especially like we went. Me and Abigail both went to Yeshiva and seminary there. Like we never think that like Israelis come here. Right, right, and they're not really. It's important to mention they're not leaving Israel because oh they're yeah most some people they know they're upset with the state or they don't they they want to run away from religion. That's not that's not really that's not what we're finding. You know the economic opportunities they feel, and for some of them it's true are greater in the United States. You know, economically, it is more difficult in Israel. Um, whether, you know, most of them don't necessarily, you know, strike it rich in America, but right. a lot of them want, feel that they'll have greater economic opportunity. Right. So can, moving on, so the, the Israeli population over the last 25 years has grown a lot here in the USA. Um, and the proof to that really is the IAC, the Israel American Council, a very prominent organization, which has seen very large growth over the last 20 years. The second uh, important factor. Wait, what, what's that? Uh, what's that? What's that program? It's called the. It's in. It's a national organization called the Israel American Council, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and they've they've expanded tremendously over the last fifteen years. And I'm just showing you that just shows the growth of the of, of the uh -huh. Israeli American population here in the USA. They have now, I think, eighteen regional offices across America. Wow. Um, that's number one. Number two is is that most Israelis, even if they're not Torah observant do not understand that they just don't keep Torah laws, right? They're not against religion. They just don't keep, either they weren't raised with it, but they don't really believe in alternative forms of Judaism. Either it's, either it's the, the authentic Torah Judaism or they just don't keep it. So it's much easier to talk to them about really the importance of the Torah's values. That's a very, that's a very important point. Yeah. Number, number one. And number two, um, they, you know, most Israelis, even again, if they're not observant, do not expect their children to intermarry here in this country. They do not want that. And, but unfortunately, and this is really the impetus, Abigail, getting to your question, is that the statistics are, and this is frightening, this is frightening, 65% of the second generation Israelis are intermarrying. 65? 65, 65, and I, and I may even be lowballing it. 65% of, 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 of second generation Israelis are intermarried. And the, the parents really don't want it. They, 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 they don't want the kids to intermarry, As, especially among the Masorati Sephardi population, which is a large percentage of the Israeli population here, but even among the standard Israelis, they really don't want that. So what, what we're trying to really, to make the Israeli population understand here is, is that what worked in Israel to keep your kids remain, have your kids remain Jewish and connected to Judaism and really the state of Israel is not gonna work in America. It just doesn't work. You can't expect your child to go to a public school and have an, um, any type of feeling of connection to, to Judaism. What I tell my donors is, and I think this is a, this is a good line, it says you can't be connected either emotionally, spiritually, or intellectually to something you know nothing about. I think it's very interesting what you're bringing up that like in Israel, it's very either you're like Dati, which is like, I think that's the religious one or like Lumi, right? Where you're not religious, but like in America, like we've got like a lot of different, like we have like, like conservative reform, like non orthodox, like yeshivish, like a lot of different levels. So you could kind of like put yourself wherever you fit. But in Israel, it's like very extreme base. But at least in Israel, like it's all Jews, so you wouldn't intermarry. So like these Israelis come here and they didn't, like have no clue that it's like a totally different culture and that it's very easy to intermarry, especially if like you're just like, okay, I'm not religious, so I just marry whoever I want. But, like in Israel, you whoever marrying you, whoever if you marry whoever you want, it's still Jewish. Right. Very good point, Zachary. Yes, it's much much easier to remain within the Jewish fold, whereas over here, 
you know, a lot of, a lot of, especially in the smaller towns, not always do they find the, the right match. And uh, you end up in relationships which you didn't expect to, or, or the children. It's, it's, it's a real, real problem. And that was one of the, that was one of the big impetus, you know, impetus to start Chinechidi, to really address this, this, this it's an it's a, a issue. And um, because once you have the feeling, the feelings for Judaism, and you understand what it's about, and there, and there are statistics to show that um, studies have been done about this, and that the, the percentage chances of a child who attends a Jewish day school, the chances of an intermarrying are significantly less, significantly. So, you know, we're really tackling this problem head on. Wow, that's amazing. So do you mind sharing with us um, some details about the services that Kinef UD offers to, yeah? Sure. So the, the major, if I were to define the mission statement of the organization is to really, you know, target the Israeli population here in the USA and to try to assist them to transfer the children to Jewish day school. Um, we focused on areas where there is some state, assist, state government assistance for private school education. Of course, the Supreme Court's decision, well, I think about two weeks ago, is a very, wow. big, boon, is a very big boon for us. Hey, what, um, what is that? The Supreme Court ruled on a case in, uh, in Montana about uh, the tax credit scholarships that the state offers. Mm -hmm. That every dollar you donate to this um, state program can be deducted from your taxes. And the question was, could that be used not just for private schools but for religious schools? And the oh, wow. Supreme Court, in the five-four decision, ruled that it could be. That oh. that is not a violation of church and state. That's great. Yeah, it's great. Just to point out, it won't help in the major Jewish metropolitan centers like New York and California, because in those states, those programs probably do not exist presently and probably won't exist for the near future. Um, but in states that they do exist and states that they're considering it, it is now legally constitutional and you, know, it, it, you can even maybe be advanced. So it is a very big help. That decision was a very big help for Chinuch Yudi. That's amazing. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that is very big help. So some of the examples, some states that we work very he heavily in are Florida and Nevada. South Florida has close to 70,000 Israelis. Um, oh. Orlando, Orlando is, a, is a population center we hope to enter soon, a growing Israeli population. Um, Las Vegas has a tremendous amount of young, young Israelis, about 10 to 15,000 Israelis there. Mm -hmm. So these are all, these are, and which these areas, these states have, um, have some form of state assistance for, for tuition. And therefore, Chinuchidi approaches the parents and says like this, there's a very strong possibility that you're gonna get some type of stipend from the state government. And therefore, once you have that, and you, you, the parents have to pay something for tuition because it is, it is expensive and it's important they, they value it. So, but they're willing to pay up to a certain amount. So when the state pays, gives a certain scholarship and the parents pay and Chinuchidi in many, most instances, will provide a scholarship to the parents. And in many instances, URA will also contribute. So there already we approach the school and say, look, we can, we, you have a, we can add, to your, to, add to, your, um, to your student population by giving you more children. And you'll be getting close to between, between let's say, ten and $12,000 for that. So that's already something that most schools, not all, but many schools say, okay, that's financially viable for us. So that is, that, that's basically the methodology of how we try to, so we approach the parents and approach, approach the schools. Um, I'd like to mention one school which has been very helpful to us, and that would be Hill Aventura in, in, in Aventura. Um, and they've been- That's the admitted, same guy you mentioned earlier? Um, um, that's a, a different school, I mean a different school. Oh. This is, that's what we've done is partner with certain schools who we, you know, who've, you know, committed to our mission as well. And one of them uh, is Hill Aventura, a very large school in, in Aventura in, in uh, South Florida. And mm -hmm. they've been very helpful to us in terms of really partnering with us in terms of families that were even hit very hard by the COVID crisis, which I'm sure you'll get to soon, and really help, helping us in terms of making, having a package that is affordable for parents. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, do you know how many people and how many, uh, I guess, schools uh, that, you're, that your company is serving? servicing? Yeah. So right now we have, I would say, um, I would say eight, eight to nine schools across the USA. Um, 
we're, you're very, and I said, we're having South Florida, Nevada, and also in Los Angeles as well, even though there is no state scholarship there. So that I would say between, uh, I think nine schools, eight or nine schools. Um, and of course we hope to expand that number. The, wow. the South Florida, and then because of the large population, it's much easier to target the, the Israeli population. They're also very well connected on uh, social media. So we've been able to we'll talk about them a little bit later um, in terms of you know, really getting the message out to the Israeli population is that we're here to help you help your children. Um, I want to mention one other point about the, the assimilation. We're just in the middle of initiating a new project I think is very exciting called Zugiyut, which is really means couples, Zugiyut in Chinuch Yudi, and which is really to service the couples and the singles that we're involved with presently to really get them connected to fellow Israelis um, across the USA. Uh, a lot of times, you know... Oh, for you know, dating? For dating, yes. Really creating a dating service. Um, <laughs> Because, as you know, people of similar culture, it's much easier to connect them. Um, they're not uh, common, whether it's common culture, or common values. And especially as they listen in small towns, they may, the, the marriage prospects are much smaller. So Chinuch Yudi has hired a woman, a designated woman, who is going to be, you know, taking in, you know, doing surveys. Uh, we're going to send out surveys to our, to our people that we service. And they will be sending in those surveys to this designated lady, and she's going to try to see which, which you know, men and, men and women, boys and girls, would be, might be appropriate for each other. So I think it's a very important um, service that Chinuch is trying to offer to really attack uh, this issue of intermarriage. You're really broadening your scope of what you do. That is true. That is true. You're right. Good point. Yes. <laughs> it is, uh, you know, and there, there is, you might say that it, maybe it's going a bit outside of our you know, of our focus. But I do think because really with Chinuch Yudi's image, it's really to fight this issue of intermarriage. Right. Among it's Israeli totally population. on point with your mission. Yeah, I do think it is on point. We're looking, like, obviously it's going to be offered to uh, the people that were our parent body and the people that we're servicing, but it will be open, you know, we're going to put it out there in social media to the Israeli population at large. And that might also be, I may add, a way of let, letting people know about the other services, about Jewish, the Jewish Day School Education, other services that we offer. So it, I think it might enhance that as well. Awesome. So it sounds like you're really a national, it's not just metropolitan area, but you're really a national um, organization. So who else is on your team? So we, and we have offices, we have, uh, what, I, what we did was, is we hired directors in the different locales. So as I said, South Florida, people are in there who are, live in the, you know, in the area that they, we service. And the advantage is, is that the people, the, the, uh, the Israelis, and then they really get to know our directors, who I must say are doing a phenomenal job, phenomenal job really connecting and really getting out the message about the importance of Jewish education for the second generation. Um, is, you know, be, as I said, because of common culture and language, and it's important that is, we have Israelis really talking to fellow Israelis. So even though I'm a born and bred American, I, I love the Israeli population. I think you look Israeli. <laughs> I try to improve my, my <laughs> whenever I can. My, my, my kids know that I always talk Israeli. I talk Hebrew whenever I can. But nonetheless, you know, that's not my job. My job is really to make sure that everything is running smoothly as the, the founder of the organization. Uh, but Israelis really have to really be talking to the Israeli population. So... You know, so we have in as in, um, South Florida, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, um, for some present now in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, we're hoping maybe to expand uh, Atlanta. Atlanta is a new is a new is a new area that we've come to service this coming this past year. So we're trying to uh, you know really expand, try to find the, the population centers. Again, a focus on the areas which have some state uh, you know, scholarship, but not exclusive to that. My dream is to help to try to build a scholarship fund, let's say for an area like New York, where there's so many Israelis, or Los Angeles, you know, build a local scholarship fund so we can help many thousands and thousands of Israelis in those areas. Oh. Wait, so um, I just want to like, like tie it all together, clarify. So like help within the state gets Israelis like money off to go to Jewish day schools. Do I have it right? Yeah, so it's a really, I mean, I'm going to describe it better exactly. It's a three-step process. 
Number one, we do, we're called to recruitment, which is Chinuch Yudi will have, you know, um, different community events, holiday events that will join with other organizations. Um, I want to mention a Rabbi Alon Roslin um, from Hollywood, who's been extremely helpful to us. Hollywood, Florida? Um, in Hollywood, Florida, yes. Um, he, let's say he puts on a, a Kriyat Megillah uh, outside in, the, in, the, in a parking lot in Hollywood for a thousand Israelis. Oh. So he'll take over, let's say, you know, Wolverine's parking lot. And we've joined with him, we've partnered with him and to talk about, you know, Jewish education and we'll get to meet new families that way. Um, another method, you know, we'll get, I'm sure you want to know about COVID is agon, but let's, let's just back up just what we've done till now. We have something called Chugay Bayit, where let's say one of our current parents will invite some of their neighbors to a more informal gathering in their home. So let's say having between seven and 15 parents in the house, just talking about issues that Israelis face you know, about Jewish identity. Um, it, it, how, do, how to retain Jewish identity here in the Golan. And of course, that will focus very much on how to keep Jewish identity for your children. Okay, by it, a lot of times word of mouth. Um, if I, I'm gonna tell you a fascinating story. I'm talking about the, one of my, my, my director in Florida called one of my parents and said, you know, do you know of anyone who might be interested in Jewish day school education for the coming year? And he said, you know, he gave the number of a certain woman and, he, and my director, his name is Rabbi Kornfeld, Rabbi Huda Kornfeld, called this woman, and he starts to talk to her about Jewish education and so on, and she starts to cry on the phone. And Rabbi Kornfeld gets like, you know, nervous. Like, Did I say anything wrong? He apologizes, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't hurt you in any way. And I'm like, is everything okay? So listen to the story that this woman tells him. You know, um, unfortunately, my dad is quite ill in the hospital. And he's, he's been bugging me for the last number of years about switching my kids to Jewish day school. And, you know, I just wasn't ready to do it. I was nervous about it, the cost and, and everything else. Maybe it's too religious for me and so on. And he's really been my, and he's been in the hospital for the last few weeks and he keeps reminding me what's going to be with my grandchildren. What, what, do we do about it? What, what do we do about your kids? And this lady tells her by Kornfeld just an hour ago, he spoke to me again. He said, what's going to be with your kids? And then you called. Oh, why? He said, I, she said to him, I see this as a sign from God. I got to do something about this. And she was serious about it. That night, they had a Zoom meeting with the, with the Jewish Academy, which is a school that we work with very heavily. Oh, this is recently was, this story? Yeah, this story happened right before Shavuot. Right before Shavuot. Wow. And, this, and, and the next day, they registered for Jewish day school. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, you never know. It's just ma- ma- at this point, mouth to mouth, you know, diff- different people just hearing about us. Um, another thing that we've done since COVID-19, of course, now the, all this involves, you know, meeting personally. So that was the challenge we had. Is I put my current events. Um, what do you do now? COVID-19 hits in March and April here. And what do we do? Kirov especially is very, you know, person to person. In, you know, interpersonal relationships. That's how we recruited till now. What are we gonna do now? So with the guidance of, you know, our, our, our Das Torah, and the president of the organization, the Nasi is Rav, Shmuel Kamen, Rav Shalom Kamenetsky in Philadelphia, Rosh Hashiva. So we decided to, to, to really, to, to make a presence on social media. Um, just again, this was for our organization to really reach the Israelis. And I wanna mention what we, what we did was we were able, you know, with a tremendous amount of siyata de Shemaya, Hashem's help, we hired Mrs. Sivan Rav here. I know you know. Uh, she's actually the Shaliyah. Yes, he's been at Stern, right? Right. So she, she was actually the Shaliyah of Mizrahi here in the USA in this past year um, to do, you know, to lecture to different uh, communities in, here in the United States. She went back, when Corona hit, she went back to Israel uh, right before Pesach. Um, and she saw, she was in Florida and really saw the plight of the, you know, you know the, the the, uh, the challenge that the Israeli community here in the USA faces. And we hired her to really make certain video clips and to really get out the message about the importance of Jewish identity and Jewish education for your children here in the USA. And I want to thank her publicly here uh, for what she's done. She's helped us tremendously. She's given us a reach that we could have never had before. She's extremely, she's, her content is amazing. She's extremely talented and she resonates you know, really with anyone who listens to her and certainly with the Israeli population. So that has been a very big help for us in terms of broadening our scope and our reach, even in a time where we could not meet people, meet people personally.
That's so smart. That's great. So it sounds like like you're not just about helping people like financially. Like you're also about creating like a sense of community. Yeah, yeah. That's I would love to. You know, that's I'd like to create that virtual community. But one thing I want to mention is that one of the I think unique things about Chinuch is that as is, is that the directors live in the areas that they service. So one of the important points we said we had recruitment, we have the financial assistance, and finding the right school for the child, which of course depends on geographic location, the educational level of the child, what the parents want, those factors put together. And then we have the follow-up, which is extremely important as well, which is ensuring that the child is succeeding in the school because it is, it is an adjustment. Part of that is, is ensuring, and this is unfortunately not, not surprising, but sad in a way, is that a lot of the kids that are coming in know how to speak Hebrew, but can't read Hebrew. And that's, of course, so, yeah. So that's crazy. Yeah, like you never think about it like that. that. Right. Think about it. Imagine uh, Americans, you know, or in, in Israel, or and let's say an American makes an, uh, is an Ola to Israel, right? The, the parents will speak English in the home, but not if they go to the Israeli school system, not necessarily they know how to read English, or, unless the parents pushed it. Wow. Right? So, so we're bringing in teachers, you know, tutors to the schools to really teach them how to read Hebrew, which is a very important for any advanced Jewish learning or davening, right? That's, very, that's imperative. Okay. The, um, so the follow-up is very important, ensuring that the child is succeeding, and really the follow-up with the parents, learning with the parents privately, having the parents go to class, tour classes by our directors or other, connecting them with the kihila in their local communities with a with with rav, ensuring that the parents are you know, also growing uh, in their observance of, of, of Judaism. So that's a very important point. And that really can only be done if you have a director on site in the neighborhood that, that, that the, parent, the families live in. Yeah, that's great. Um, actually, this, yeah, sorry, I had to go for it. Sorry. Um, I think one of the things that to me is most compelling is that you're meeting them where they are and you're, you're understanding their plight and then trying to create this community, trying to enhance this community that they already have, instead of sort of bringing them over to our side, you're trying to meet them where they are and enhance their life. So that's really awesome. Oh, you're, you're on mute, Riley Bernstein. Okay. Are we good? Um, yeah, yeah, you're good. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, no, thank you, Abigail. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, another uh, quick story about that. Uh, right before Yom, Yom Kippur, my, my Rabbi Kornfeld had a meeting with a bunch of Israelis, and he, you know they were talking to me like, you know, what should we do? You know, we're, uh, we, you know, we know we have, want to go to Shul on Yom Kippur, but like we're not observant. You know, we don't really keep anything really during the year. And Rabbi Kornfeld told them something very important. He said, you know, and it was actually based on a conversation that our directors had with Rav Shalom Kamenetsky. And, and again, I want to I want to publicly thank him as well. And he's a I mean, he, he's a very, very busy person, Harav Shalom. He said he has a running, a, you know, really um, a first class yeshiva and with many, many obligations. And he's been, you know, tried as hard as he can to make himself available for us. And his, of course, his das Torah um, has been invaluable to us. So again, I want to thank him publicly as well. Um, so he had a, conver he had a um, conversation with our directors, emphasizing to them that, you know, Judaism is not all or nothing, right? If you take a step in the right direction, you know, that's also very, very valuable. Don't, do not, it's, growth is a step-by-step -step process. And if they take one step in the right direction, that's extremely valuable. And Rabbi Kornfeld related that to them at this meeting, um, I think even that night. And one of the people said, you know what? I'm going to stop smoking on Shabbos. I'm going to try that. And that's an amazing thing. It's, it's beautiful. So, you know, as you said, Abba, talking, meeting them where they are, really trying to, you know, just what their needs are, how can we help them become better people and connect to fellow Israelis and eventually connect to the American Jewish population, but, but really, really connect, give them a sense of community, which a lot of Israelis, unfortunately, in the USA do not have. That's great. What are the short-term and long-term goals for Chin Chiyudi? Okay. So short-term... I would say is to ensure, you know, in, in the states that we, that we are servicing, we want to make sure that we can reach, you know, that population that we're servicing. And that's everyone, at least in the areas we're servicing, 
knows about our services, um, try to maybe even bring in more people, hopefully bring someone else on board in South Florida, tell Robert Kornfeld, because he's right now a one-man show. And it's, uh, it's a lot, but we have over you know, 140 families of kids that we put into Jewish day school. And that's, you know, in terms of, you know, ensuring that it, making sure all the pieces are moving correctly, that's a big job. So having, bring more people on board, you know, in our local communities that we're servicing. And I would say long-term to really expand across the USA. This is, I think we have a model that could be worked out in other communities. Um, the challenge might be, of course, as I said, in New York and Los Angeles, the, the financial part of it. But I think when people will see the opportunity that there is in the, for the Israeli population to really impact children and families for a lifetime. You're, you're, when you change a child, there's no question you're changing his trajectory. Um, I'm gonna give you a simple example. Who would it be the, when these kids go to college, right? If they don't know anything about the land of Israel and the importance, the centrality of the land of, of, of Eretz Israel to our existence, how will they be able to fight BDS? Why do we deserve Eretz Israel? Why do we? And believe me, this is a question that I think many American Jewish college students don't really necessarily know the answer to. But we do. We know that the Torah promised that God promised it to the Jewish people in the Torah. Right? If that's not clear to them, then they're going to be very much on the fence. And I mean, this is one small example of many um, that you know we could give. So it's extremely important in terms of their whole. When you, the, found, the foundation that we give children in our education, um, you know, it's one of the, the mentors that's helping me over the summer uh, from the YU Consulting Force coined a great line. You know, is chai, the, the initials are chai, which of course means life. Um, and she, and, and the, 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 the phrase that they coined was giving life by educating. And it's a great line, giving life by educating. And that's really the truth. Um, Rye Bernstein, so we know that you got here because, uh, I mean, we're here now for that you're part of the OU Accelerator cohort. Um, can you go into a little bit, can you tell us a little bit about your story about what made you decide to apply for the OU Accelerator, like how you found out about it and what the process was like and what, uh, leading up to when you finally got accepted? One fine day, I was reading a, news, <laughs> a uh, <laughs> newspaper. I like fine days. I was reading, <laughs> yeah, um, I was reading a uh, magazine article and I see an endorsement. Though you was having a, opening this impact accelerator for, uh, for startups. I said, you know what, let me try, I'll apply. Now little did I know that I had 80 other <laughs> startups as competition. I'm not sure I would have done if I knew I had so much competition. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, so no, the application process was pretty easy. It was not, it was not you know, you know, it was very, uh, it was really not hard at all. Uh, it did, of course, whenever you have to apply for something like this, it forces you to focus on what your mission is, what you, as you say, what your goals are, we, you know, what's your budget. And when you're, when you're in startup, all those things are a little bit nebulous, shall I say, because you're just running everything yourself. Um, I'm not even actually taking a salary for this. Um, my, uh -huh. As I said, primary, my primary, yeah, th yeah, thank you, my, my primary job is really in yeshiva. So again, if it gets busy enough, I'll have to see what to do right. Right now, my primary job is in the Yeshiva of Waterbury. Um, I also want to thank, you know, my, 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 our Rosh Hashiva, my Aaron Kaufman, the Yeshiva of Waterbury, for really allowing me to be able to do this, you know, as, as a secondary thing, which again, he's very, very supportive of the mission that we're doing as well. So, um, so I, I applied, and, you know, thank God it was accepted. Uh, of course, you know, the financial stipend at the end is very helpful, no question about it. But with the OU is, First of all, the classes have been very stimulating. Um, the lecturers have been great. Um, it's forced us, forced me to focus on what our mission is and to stay focused to that mission in as much as I can. Um, you know, because it, it, the, the importance of that. Um, another important, first of all, I, you know, just to be honest, the, the prestige. In other words, when I come down to a donor and say that, you know, I am, I was selected by the OU Impact Accelerator, that says something to a donor. That means this is the, you know, a whole outside group, not just Chaim Bernstein, but an outside group of you know, educated people who looked at 80 organizations and said, this is something that's worthwhile. That's extremely valuable. It's extremely valuable. So 
that, that, that in of itself is very valuable. Um, the, you know, as I said, the, the, the classes, the, uh, unfortunately we haven't been able to be, you know, we're doing everything virtually. I haven't been able to meet other co, you know, court members in person. You haven't but, met them. No, you haven't met them yet. Or? No, we met them once, met them once, once or twice. Yeah. Again, that's just the nature of COVID, unfortunately. Um, yeah. so, but the, you know, the, the class have been, have been great. The, the connections as well. I, that's another point I want to make mention in terms of just reaching out and networking, networking. The networking has been very helpful. Uh, and the YU Consulting Force, which was a, I was able to, uh, to, to get to through the OU Impact, Impact Accelerator. Um, I just had a phone call yesterday with Rabbi Ari Rokoff uh, from the OU about foundations, you know, directing me a little bit, how we approach that, you know, which foundations are relevant, which foundations are not. These are, these are very important, you know, things that I would not have known myself um, because there's only so much time in the day and just sometimes just missing information. So in all those areas, the OU has been very helpful. Wow. Glad that you're part of the cohort. <laughs> <laughs> me too. You're really uh, getting everything from it. It's good to hear. Um, <laughs> we touched on it a little bit, but can we hear a little bit more about how Chinuch Yehudi sort of dealt with Corona and everything going virtual? Right. So uh, you won't believe this, but I don't, I don't have a smartphone. <laughs> and... Uh, but you know, it's I, obviously you know, as I said, the Israelis are on social media, and it, it's, it is necessary to, re to reach that community, to reach the Israelis. Um, so, you know, we had to really develop I mean, the the social media aspect of it. Um, I believe that you know the online component will be very uh, online fundraising, and um, in, in general, that really is the wave of the future um, in terms of reaching people and getting people the way they are. And especially these areas are very well connected. And I think we'll be able to give a lot of content um, to, you know, to the Israeli population on, on, through Facebook and other, other, other channels. Um, we plan, as I said, the Zugi Youth is this program for, for, young, for young adults. We're going to be advertising through, through the Israel. We're going to have an Israeli and uh, Hebrew and English Facebook page. Oh, wow. That's so interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's in order to make sure that we reach everybody. So, you know, some, a lot of people, a lot of the Israelis will, will, you know, focus on the Israeli page. So I think that that's how COVID impacted us. Um, of course, schooling, it's a little bit more difficult because, because school is virtual, you know, some parents might be thinking, you know, well, why should I switch my kid to Jewish day school? You know, um, they're going to be, they're virtually anyway. I want to mention an important point, which is I think to your, to your listeners is very important, is that as we know as parents, not just what you learn is impacts you, but your friends. You know, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. Friends are very important and they have a tremendous impact on a child's, a child's uh, upbringing and worldview. And if a child is not in a Jewish, frame, in a Jewish day school framework, you know, who's, in, who's, face, who's impacting that worldview? Uh, a week ago, I just spoke to a parent from Atlanta who's actually transferring their kid to Atlanta Jewish Academy. And they told me, they said, you know, the parent, the kid, the children would come home talking about Halloween, you know, and, and you know, the non-Jewish holidays. You know, what, do we, what lessons do we want our kids to be learning? And wh who are they learning it from? Th these are questions that parents have to ask themselves. So it's not only about what you learn, but who are their friends going to be? And it's very, very important that they have, you know, Jewish friends, extremely important, because that will impact who they become in the future. Yeah, it's very well said. I definitely, I definitely would agree with that. Like, I think even like the reason that, like, I don't know about you, Abigail, but I think the reason why, I, like, I always like choose my schooling based off of where I know, like, it's people that like I'd want to be around. So it's definitely important, like, that has an influence. Um, just another question uh, regarding Corona. Have has this like a whole situation helped your company learn something new about like how to be successful? Yeah, surely. Surely, yeah. Um, again, I would, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I would have never um, pushed the social media aspect, probably not so much for Corona. And so it, it, in a way, it was very good that this happened. Um, that, was, that's a very, that was a very big benefit. Getting, of course, to Mrs. Sivan Rameir, as I mentioned previously, that was a major benefit. Uh, we would, I don't know if we would have pushed the, you know, those video clips and God willing, shoot him that she might, you know, that she'll be saying. <clears throat> because that can be done virtually, right? She's now back in Israel. 
but she can certainly still, you know, help the Israeli population here in the USA. So, you know, that's, that's a result of Corona. Um, fundraising is a bit more of a challenge, a little bit, um, but I do want to add, and it's, there's no question about this, and then I think it's important to you know, anyone that's listening, any nonprofit, I, fundraising is 100% Siat is, 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 is from Hashem. Things that 100%. You know, we have to do our tablets, we have to do, put in our efforts, but you really don't know where the results are going to come from. You'd be, I'm, I'm, myself, I'm shocked. You know, things that happened, you know, things I would have never expected, a, a gift from God. So, I, you know, it's really, don't give up. And you have to dive in. You have to dive in. in any venture you start, any non-venture you have to ask, Hashem has to be your partner. Hashem is your partner. How did you know what our next question was going to be? <laughs> The next question was going to be, what are your tips to someone who is, has this great idea and wants to go for it? Yeah. So, there you go. <laughs> okay, there we go. So the first thing is really, is, is, is you have to recognize that the results are not up to you. You have to do your established. You have to, I would say another important point is you have to really look for the benefit um, of the benefit people you're servicing. In other words, in as much as possible, people are, can see through... Um, you know, I don't want to say, the word's not phony, but like they, they, they see real, they see real, you know, they want to see a real person. So it's important that you be real to who you are and your mission. It's very, it's very important. And, you know, and you really, Hashem has to, you know, you have to ask Hashem to be your partner. You cannot do it yourself. There's too many moving pieces, so much, so many unknowns. There's always a risk involved because especially when you're dealing with a startup venture, many businesses fail. You know, you, you can look at the statistics even for profit businesses. You know, there's no guarantee of success, as we know. So you really have to ask Hashem for Seattle, if you know, divine assistance to be successful. And, uh, and there's still, obviously, there's still no guarantee. But there's no question that, that davening and prayer plays a major role in, in, in any success. Because that really is the key to, to unlock that divine assistance. Um, and then hard work, you know, just to gather, you got to be at it. To be willing. I would say one other thing. You, especially as a startup, there's a lot of things we don't know. Um, you have to be, listening is a very important component. One quick example. Um, there was a certain logo that I picked originally when I started Chinuch Yudi, which I happen to have liked a lot. And certain people told me that, you know, we think that, you know, something would be more appealing to the Israeli population, you should, you should change it. Now, I happen to have loved the logo <laughs> that I chose. I'm, I'm here. But you know what? It's not about my own personal feelings. It's about being effective. That's the bottom line. So the listening is an important, you know, you have to be able to you know, really listen to people who have made more experience um, and more, you know, more knowledge than you and, and take that into account in your decision-making process. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. It's definitely tough. Like when, when you started something, like you kind of think it's like your baby in a way. And like, it's like someone's telling you to change something that you don't, didn't necessarily like. It's like, like, who are you telling me what to do? But sometimes you got to, like, remember that it's about, like, what, what your goal is and not about what you did, in a way. I guess that's right. what you're trying to get at. Right. Yeah. All right, cool. So that's all the questions we had. Thanks so much, Ryan Bernstein, for being with us here today. This it's been great. really, yeah, so much fun. A lot of great stories. <laughs> Thank you very much. And wishing you a lot of success with the Impact Accelerator. And uh, you guys are doing a great job. You really, you, the Impact Accelerator is impacting uh, North American Jewry. <laughs> Thank you. All right, take I, care, I, I, viewers. You know, so funny, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great day, guys. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.